Oh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you may be. We are streaming with you virtually as uh, as uh, things in New York start to, to clear up. We're hoping to have uh, some hybrid in-person meetings uh, someday soon, but until now, we're, st then, uh, we're still uh, here uh, in the webinar format, but it's great. So, so I know we have people from, uh, from all over the world joining as a result. Um, I am Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my distinct honor uh, to welcome you to this special webinar to launch the book, Whose Peace Are We Building? Leadership for Peace in Africa by Yusuf Mahmoud and Albert Yatem. This um, book brings together reflections and lessons from Yusuf Mahmoud's truly uh, storied career at the heart of the United Nations, including stints as executive representative of the Secretary General in Burundi and special representative of the Secretary General in Chad and the Central African Republic. I uh, personally feel grateful to have um, have had the benefit of having heard some of these reflections over the years working with Yusuf at IPI, um, having him as a senior advisor, counsel, confidant at IPI has, um, has really been one of the true uh, privileges of, of my career. So Yusuf, really thank you so much uh, for that. And so I do feel it is, it is fantastic to see this material, have this material now uh, in a book to share with the world so that so many others can uh, reap the benefits of Yusuf's experience. This book is uh, part memoir. It goes actually back to his family history, um, part treatise on the theory and practice of peace building and operational leadership. But it, um, to my mind, does something quite unusual for this kind of book, the, the testament of the senior statement, statesman. It, it not only expounds upon the lessons learned from experience, um, it doesn't just, just uh, but it, it also, um, it asks, what would I do differently today if I was put in a position of leadership? Um, and so the book is not just a reflection on the past with stories to tell, there are, there are many, um, but is a guide for the future uh, for both the young and also for those currently uh, in leadership uh, positions. And it asks, what kind of leadership styles, processes, and strategies will be most effective in developing a constructive approach to diplomacy that works to restore and sustain peace in the most challenging contexts. And we have a really uh, fantastic group uh, assembled here to discuss all this. We will, of course, uh, first hear from the authors, who I will turn to uh, shortly. And then we will uh, have an interactive conversation with our esteemed panel of discussants, who I'll introduce then. And then followed by a brief uh, Q&A from our public audience. Those of you who are participating in the Zoom webinar can submit questions via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we, but we will also be monitoring all of IPI's social media channels for additional questions from our, our global audience. Um, but let's get to it. Dr. Yusuf Mahmoud is indeed a senior advisor at the International Peace Institute and a visiting professor at the African Leadership Center, King's College, London. He is a former UN Undersecretary General, having headed peace operations in Burundi, the Central African Republic, and Chad. In 2015, he served as both a member of the Secretary General's High Level Independent Panel on Peace Operations, uh, known as HIPPO, and as a member of the High Level Advisory Group for the Global Study on Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. And uh, most recently in 2019, he led an independent strategic review of MINUSCO, the UN peace operation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, much experience for us to learn from. Yusuf, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Adam, for those uh, that generous in introduction and those kind words. As you have alluded, uh, this book uh, charts uh, the defining moments of my personal and 
professional leadership journey uh, with particular focus on the challenges I faced, the responses I improvised and the lessons I learned as a senior UN envoy and head of two peace operations. Um, the seven uh, chapter book devotes four chapters to these operations. Um, in these chapters, I explain why peace outcomes fell short of expectations, largely as a result of the gap between what Security Council mandates dictated and what the complex realities on the ground allowed. This is particularly the case in Burundi. I, I won't bore you with the details uh, relating to the mission I led in Chad and Central African Republic. Minurkat. Uh, this mission has gone through the stages of planning, deployment, and withdrawal in the short span of less than four years, enduring adversities in each. I was entrusted, I should recall, with the task of leading that mission to the exit door. But for the purposes of this launch, I will draw mainly my remarks on the last chapter of the book, um, in that chapter, I review some of the conceptual shifts that are needed to sharpen our understanding of peace and leadership and offer some lessons I learned along the way. In that chapter, as you alluded, I also speculate on what I would do differently if I were to lead another UN peace operations again. Uh, I will not delve into the final part of that chapter where I propose a few peace and leadership issues that I felt could benefit from further research. I would leave it to Dr. Albert Mbiatem, my writing companion, and the distinguished um, discussants to highlight what they deem of particular relevance to them uh, that I may or may not have touched upon. So let me begin with a couple of conceptual shifts. When I uh, started uh, working um, in the area of peace and security, whether at the UN Secretariat or in the field, I was laboring under the assumption that if I understood the pathology of civil wars and the complex factors driving them, I would be able not only to arrest or mitigate the violence, but also foster durable peace. Under this, um, paradigm, peace was treated as an exception, largely bounded by um, seemingly immutable external normative moorings that tied its fortunes to the presence or absence of conflict. Another way of saying this is that I was wedded to the notion that preventing conflict through peace building was the true pathway to sustainable peace. I did not know any better. I never studied peace directly or developed a strategy where peace rather than conflict was the starting point and the ultimate goal. So one of the early shifts I had to go through after trial and error was to acknowledge, for example, that countries emerging from conflict are not blank pages and that efforts to sustain peace should be motivated by learning from what still works well in these countries and to respect that every society, however broken it may be, has capacities and assets, not just needs and vulnerabilities that needed to be fixed. This shift entailed rethinking how we analyze conflict contexts. Assessing the factors driving and sustaining violence is important but it should be complemented by a mapping of the endogenous capacities that enable communities to peacefully prevent and manage conflict despite internal vulnerabilities and external pressure. This analytical shift takes people away from the obsessive examination of what is wrong in their country and help them uncover and strengthen what's already strong. I say uncover because peace, unlike conflict, tends to be invisible and is often taken for granted until it is lost. 
such an analytical approach goes against the mainstream of peace building, which I perfected. Um, it assumes that countries in conflict lack the competency, the agency, and certainly the resources to address their own predicament. So what are some of the implications of such a conceptual shift? There are many leadership implications. Let me just mention one. Leadership for peace is not about the leader, or at least let me say, it is not about just the leader or about the changes that outsiders can bring about in ending violence and building peace. It's about suspending certainties and judgments. It's about listening intently to those that the UN missions are intended to serve because they are intimately familiar with the problems afflicting them and they tend, guess what, to have solutions. In the book, I define leadership for sustaining peace as the processes that create and nurture an empowering environment that enables people to draw on their capacities to resolve conflict nonviolently and chart a path towards durable peace. This definition is motivated by a more nuanced understanding of peace that taps into the human needs for harmonious relationships rather than the overstated potential for violent conflict. And this brings me to what I would do differently if I were to lead another UN mission, leveraging some of the lessons I've learned. I would definitely make it a point to practice the art and craft of deep and reflective listening. Faced with challenging circumstances, we invariably listen with the intent to help or solve, not with the intent to understand. And thus listening with, in with intent, uh, as I mentioned earlier, has been a defining practice of my leadership styles. Although I must confess, it is hard and it requires a great deal of presence and humility. But I continue to return to it whenever confronted with situations over which I have little control or influence. I would also make a point of remembering that in the changing environment, the changing and uncertain environments in which peace operations are deployed, context and followers are far more important than leaders however exalted that leadership position might be. As a manager of a UN mission, I would recognize the valuable benefits of drawing on the diverse expertise and perspectives of, quote, followers, unquote, whose values, belief systems, language, and culture may be different from mine. In countries under stress, I would enhance, I would, I would embrace the notion that leaders emerge from many places and no society, however broken, is bereft of ideas or aspirations. I also have learned that expecting to be declared persona non grata at some point in your career should be part of any UN high level representative's DNA. This is all the more important when such a representative is serving in a politically charged environment and is expected to take a stand when the values and principles of the UN Charter are flouted by governing elites. In this connection, I found that my legitimacy as a UN envoy rested on three pillars. The trust of the Secretary General, the blessing of the Security Council and the continued consent of the host government. Of the three pillars, as I recount in the book, it is the last, as my experience in Burundi attests, that determines the longevity, the longevity of tenure, regardless of the approval quotient, the two pillars, the two other pillars may furnish. So by way of conclusion, I would say 
that with this, what this book aspires to do is to uh, offer practitioners, uh, policy makers, as well as scholars, a framework to better make sense of how peace is built and sustained in complex conflict settings by interrogating some of the powerful assumptions that have informed UN peace building and peacekeeping policies and practices, the book hopes to create space for more nuanced approaches to peace building. It is also the ambition of this book to foster new thinking about the type of leadership that is needed to lay the foundations for self-sustainable peace, particularly in societies under stress. I thank you for listening. Right, thank you so much, Yusuf. For those of you listening, you can tell that this book is eminently quotable. Um, peace, unlike conflict, is invisible and tends to be taken for granted only uh, when it is lost. I think that is a, a profound thought. Um, and peace rather than, rather than conflict is the starting point uh, for all of Yusuf's reflections here. We need to study it. Uh, leadership is about listening, inclusivity. It's not just about the, the great leader themselves. Um, we'll now turn to uh, uh, Yusuf's uh, uh, co-author, Dr. Alba Biatem, who is a member of the African Leadership Center's Central African Hub and an alumnus of the African Leadership Center's Peace and Security Fellowship Program at King's College London. Um, and, and speaking of, of Yusuf's <laughs> focus on inclusivity, uh, Albert, this book, is, as a result, is a, is a product of an intergenerational uh, collaboration between uh, a young, accomplished scholar uh, like yourself and, and uh, a senior, august practitioner like, like uh, Yusuf. So Yusuf is uh, um, walking, uh, walking the walk as well. Could you share with us your, your experience of this collaboration? Tell us your reflections on the book and also maybe about that intergenerational aspect of this uh, partnership. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Adam. Uh, uh, forgive me the opportunity to uh, present the book at my level. I will begin with uh, the question, uh, what is intergenerational collaboration all about? And I will simply say it's about sharing best values, skills, and attitudes that each generation offers. In our case, I mean, that's with uh, Mahmoud, uh, Professor Mahmoud yourself, the exchange of knowledge have to be sincere <clears throat> and experience wasn't on equal basis. Since I gained more from the well-experienced uh, Professor Youssef, who doubled both as a practitioner and a scholar. Uh, before I proceed with the key aspects that underpin our uh, intergenerational research collaboration, permit me please to place it into context. Uh, the intergenerational research collaboration between myself and Mahmoud Youssef <clears throat> took place under the Leading Practitioners Program of the African Leadership Center, a program initially uh, and insightfully conceived by Professor Fumi Olini Shakin, the founding director of the center. Uh, this program is fundamentally meant to consolidate the nexus uh, between uh, theory and practice uh, by setting of avenues for mutual exchange of experience between the researchers and practitioners. So uh, in this case, uh, we have alumni and fellows of the African Leadership Center paired with leading practitioners <clears throat> to that effect. <clears throat> As you all know, I was paired with uh, Professor Youssef and the following aspects underpin my research collaboration with him. <clears throat> uh, the first aspect is I had to revisit the assumption on peace and leadership. This aspect mainly speaks to my then role in the book project as I produced the first draft of the book, relying mainly on primary and secondary data collected via interviews and desk research. <clears throat> the co-creation the, the co of knowledge here fundamentally refers to the mutual exchange of knowledge on leadership. <clears throat> As a former student of leadership, I'm now a researcher on leadership, I could share conceptual and theoretical knowledge on leadership with the leading practitioner 
And in return, uh, the leading practitioner that is Mahmoud uh, Yusuf uh, shared leadership in his diverse practicality. And to me, that has been the linchpin of this collaboration. Uh, I was uh, due to this uh, amazing, that's another aspect of our collaboration, the intergenerational collaboration. I was equally exposed to the complexities surrounding UNP's mission on the ground. This aspect discloses the discrepancies on how a mission should operate and how in actual fact it operates and also the intricacies pertaining to stakes of the whole state that is important to uh, point it out the stakes of the whole state uh, the book itself uh, we are talking about uh, being a kind of result of co-creation but the book itself uh, to us or to me is uh, an <clears throat> African co-creation of knowledge in the area of leadership and peace. As earlier explained in details by Professor Yusuf, this book speaks to the key aspect of listening, not with the intent to solve, but to help. The book therefore demonstrates that Leadership for peace is not about the assumed brilliant, and maybe I will say that in code, conflict resolution skills of external experts, but rather how such skills are connected to local realities as to attain sustainable or self-sustainable peace. This is to say, leadership is not just about or personal or positional, but most importantly, relational, whereby societal needs, demands are prioritized in that process. This uh, co creation of knowledge, uh, that is the book we are talking about, is currently used uh, by myself in many of my conflict resolution courses at the University of Boya. And it's more of a practical guide to, in, to, to many students because uh, they can realize or, or they can see African speaking uh, to leadership, to peace in the continent with a lot of facts based on Professor Mahmoud Yusuf experience. And so this book has specifically been useful for a cause <clears throat> tied to peace building in Africa as the book emerges as a suitable guide to explain peace building case studies on a continent. Uh, since I, I, I gave my, uh, some of uh, my few minutes, I don't want to be long. And I'm concluding by saying that uh, lastly, from my experience with Professor Youssef Mahmoud, which to me was an amazing experience with very minor challenges, challenges maybe at a level of, uh, uh, of the, 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 some of the technicalities, but in terms of interpersonal relationship, it was so amazing. And what did I get from this leading practitioner? I understood it's important to think of what one can personally do to help the society. This is what to me, Professor Mahmoud yourself does excellently by constructively thinking to create sustainable environment for future generation. Thank you uh, for listening to me. Uh, I'm open to questions and uh, I'm fine. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes, hopefully we'll have time for questions later. And, and also, I mean, I think that um, one question that, that I have is uh, um, that we'll just maybe Yusuf can discuss later. You. you the key of this partnership was a mutual exchange of, law, of, of knowledge. And I'm really curious to know what, what Yusuf learned uh, from you, because clearly you have a, a lot of, uh, of, of knowledge and insight there uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting to me that it seems that this partnership itself is a performance of many of the lessons that Yusuf is, is discussing in, in the book, that the key aspect of leadership is listening. Um, and leadership is relational. I can see that that, uh, that was performed in your partnership on this book. 
Um, but of course, you note that the, one of the great benefits was to, to learn from Yusuf's practical experience. And of course, our next uh, discussants have, uh, have a wealth of practical experience uh, among them. And so uh, uh, we will turn to them now. Um, first, we will hear from uh, um, Ambassador Fatima Kiari Mohammed who is the permanent observer of the African Union to the UN. Uh, she was also the candidate for Nigeria and ECOWAS for Commissioner of Peace and Security of the African Union Commission in 2016. And prior to her appointment, uh, she was senior special advisor to the ECOWAS Commission. Uh, much experience on the multilateral uh, level in the, on the continent. Um, Ambassador, maybe you could share with us how you see uh, some of the most direct policy implications of, uh, of this work uh, for the African Union's uh, uh, peace and security architecture work, peace building on the continent and, and such. Please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Adam. And it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor for me uh, to be here with you uh, this morning. And let me start uh, by congratulating uh, my dear brother, uh, Dr. Youssef Mahmoud and uh, Dr. Albert uh, for, for this uh, initiative. And, and thank you once again, um, IPI for this, uh, for this invitation. Um, maybe before making my comments, I'd also like to let, recognize my fellow uh, discussants, Ambassador Oud Abdullah, um, Professor Olani Sakin and um, of course, as Oscar Fernando uh, Taranco, who I'm honored to share this uh, platform uh, with. Um, in terms of aspects of, of, of the book that have uh, uh, resonated with me and maybe I'll also tie in you know, some of the, um, uh, my experiences currently uh, working uh, with the UN. Let me start by, you know, just a very general comment in terms of uh, the book itself, uh, which I found uh, uh, a very easy read uh, because it, it literally draws you in. It, it, it's a fine balance between, you know, the personal and, and, and professional experience. And there were a number of aspects that stood out for me and resonated with me. Um, and it was also very enlightening, of course, to learn um, more about aspects of my work through the experience uh, of, of, of Dr. Um, Yosef. Um, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to focus on what I, I would call my three Ps um, and what I was able to extract um, from the book. Uh, the first P would be, you know, the personal journey. Um, such a fascinating story of how uh, this story was very personal, but was a story of leadership uh, while tying in, you know, a lot of the lessons from real life experiences and how these real life experiences influenced, you know, the professional experience. Um, and I think this is something that um, a lot of us uh, can, can, can resonate uh, with us. Um, the second P for me uh, which is fundamentally linked to um, the work that I, you know, currently do and uh, uh, my experience so far is in terms of partnership and particularly the partnership between the African Union um, and the UN. Uh, whether it was conscious or not, whether it was formal or not, it reinforces kind of the notion um, that reinforced partnership between the two entities is inevitable. And this rings true not only in the specific country context, uh, uh, such as the one described in the book, uh, but also in terms of today's reality where the role of sub-regional and regional organizations can simply uh, not, be, not be ignored. Um, this, uh, my comments are principally in terms of, you know, chapter four, uh, where it, you know, the book kind of highlights, you know, some of the gaps that are more often than not exist in terms of the mandate that is given uh, and the rea reality on the ground and how leadership plays a critical role in the success or otherwise uh, of these mandates. Uh, leadership in terms of the ability, uh, first of all, to adapt to the realities, um, to listen with an open mind and with intent to use um, Dr. Mahmoud's words. And, as this, and also to understand um, what is needed and what can be achieved within the limitations of the mandate and resources that are provided. 
particularly when the right institutional frameworks are not in place to ensure implementation, which more often than not is the case when dealing with conflict or post-conflict situations. So in terms of the collaboration between the UN and the African Union um, in peace building processes, this, this particular chapter presents a concrete example of how uh, the two organizations can support each other and how the comparative advantages of each entity can be uh, leveraged. Um, in the Burundi, Burundi context in particular, uh, with the African Union uh, being on the ground, um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, as the ESRG, was able to leverage uh, this relationship uh, with the AU representative and work together towards uh, the transformation that was needed to support the country towards um, uh, stability. Um, and here I, I, I extracted actually a, a quote from the introduction that um, stood out for me, which was that UN, and I quote, UN led peace operations tend to last for years. They do not lay the ground for sustainable peace. And, and, and that question kind of stood with me uh, throughout when I was reading, uh, reading the book. And when I got to um, chapter four in particular, it was clear that um, you know, this belief that effective partnership and long-term commitment is necessary uh, to support conflict-affected countries. Um, we've seen an increasing number of institutional actors supporting countries that are emerging from conflict or going through uh, different transitions. And um, this has to be uh, consistent with the principles, particularly of um, uh, local, national, and to an extent, uh, even uh, regional ownership um, and leadership. Um, my third point um, and third and last point would be uh, the third P, which is policy and practice. And um, this is one aspect that is, you know, very personal, personal to me. Um, and it's on the issue of gender mainstreaming um, and where uh, aspects of, you know, the resolution uh, were, were resolution 1325 the mission itself was called upon to take into um, account the rights of women uh, and gender um, considerations. Um, I think it presents the challenges of the reality of you know, the gaps that we often see in terms of understanding um, uh, uh, global policy uh, on the one hand, um, the translation and adaptation and implementation in national contexts and particularly national contexts that are um, uh, post-conflict um, or with weak, weak institutions. The issue of women's participation, of course, continues to be a struggle um, and our efforts need to be conscious in order to ensure that mainstreaming becomes the norm rather, rather than the exception. And um, while we must acknowledge that women must be given uh, the space in the broad discussion about peace and uh, security. A lot of progress has been made and we have seen particularly with uh, you know, the recent anniversary of Agenda 1325, but it's clear that we also have um, a long way to go and change can only come by looking at um, you know, the conflict issues from different complementary um, perspectives. Um, so I'll, end here and um, I look forward to the um, uh, Q&A &A session and be able to share more perspectives on, 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 on the book. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really uh, uh, excellent insights there on, on partnership and, and, and the gender aspects, which I know are very uh, important to Yusuf. We speak about that a lot at IPI. Um, and thank you for bring, uh, bringing us now closer to some of the specific contexts that are discussed in the book, uh, in particular uh, Burundi and, and how it shows a, a good example of the comparative advantages of how the UN and the AU can work together. I think with our next speaker, we'll, we'll hear some more specifically about the Burundi context. Uh, next speaker, many of you uh, know uh, quite well, Ambassador Amadou Old Abdala is president of the Center for uh, Strategy and Security in the Sahel Sahara. Center for Est, as it is known, and former uh, UN Special Envoy to Burundi. In 2015, Mr. Abdallah was a member of the Secretary General's Advisory Group of Experts 
on the review of the peace building architecture. And prior to this, he served as special representative of the Secretary General in Somalia from September 2007 to June 2010, and as special representative of the Secretary General for West Africa and chairman of the Cameroon Nigeria Nix Commission from 2002 to 2007. Um, in, um, ah, yeah. Uh, so ambassador, sorry, you were, uh, you were indeed in Burundi in the uh, early, early 90s uh, as UN Special Envoy um, during what we can all recognize was a, was a tense period. Um, and you also also wrote a book on, on this, Burundi on the Brink, which many of us have read. Um, what, what aspects of Yusuf's experience are most resonated with you in, in that context? Uh, Mr. Obdala, please, the floor is yours. And you're on mute, please. Sorry, sir, you're, uh, you're on mute, we can't hear you. There Hello? You go. Very good. Yes, now we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you. But I'm 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 very happy to be with you here. I'm I'm now in Paris uh, for meetings. Uh, I have just been appointed to uh, to do some work in uh, Chad after the crisis uh, as a special representative of uh, organization International de la Francophonie, French speaking countries organization, Secretary General has appointed me. And uh, while reading the book of my friend and uh, colleague, uh, uh, Yusuf Mahmoud, I was stuck by what you wrote about uh, Chad. So I said, I'm more interested in what you wrote about Chad than about Burundi. And uh, especially page 110, 111, 112, it is written uh, from his experience and it is so actual uh, that, uh, of course, uh, it, it is very important and I can understand it, drawing lesson from my experience in, uh, in Burundi and in some other cases like Cote d'Ivoire and so on. But uh, I hope I have said hello to everyone, to particularly to, Fami, uh, to Fatima, to Fumi, Oscar, with whom we have been doing some work, and uh, uh, with all of you. So the, 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 first, the impression I have on, on the book again is how uh, Yusuf and uh, being his friend, I know how he is malicious in thinking and writing what he he thinks and what he has shown and what he wrote about about Chad again was striking on Burundi I as you know I was the first representative when it was uh, it was the first generation of special representative it was not easy in the crisis and we did the work my colleague and myself uh, more on a traditional way in, in my region, in Africa, we do work than on thinking. And uh, for a number of reasons, it has been worked. The president was killed. Uh, if we implement the constitution, it is a disaster. If we don't, it is a disaster. So what to do? And we finally managed to amend the constitution, not a referendum, and uh, just elect president by assembly. And the way uh, Yusuf uh, reported all this and the intricate difficulties in Burundi. Burundi is, as you know, landlocked countries, but many people think it is like an island. So it is not, it is not like an island. Uh, islands are more open, but landlocked countries are suspicious. So, Anything you have to say, you have to be careful. People don't have at that time family names, so you can speak to someone about his husband or his wife or children, you don't know. So all this is difficult. But the main point uh, for me uh, is the way Yusuf described, you know, the need for a mediator or a special representative to try to put distance calm vis-a-vis -vis 
urgency and emergency problem. You know, uh, distance is very important. At the same time, the dilemma, the dilemma in time of crisis, how to avoid contradiction because you are the focus of all attention especially in the small countries. Uh, you know, how to avoid contradiction and how not to follow necessarily what looks so logical. When there is suspicion, there is no logic. How to, to avoid what is reasonable. People face reality, they face suspicion, they face death. So overall, I think it was easier to be special representative at that time than today, because less external actor. Today, you have not only the main actor, WhatsApp, which means everyone can be an actor, but you have so many actors, regional organization, international organization, and everyone talk, and you also mention it, how to coordinate, to harmonize, you cannot coordinate. It is more pronounced than implemented. You cannot harmonize, you cannot coordinate action. So the, the book for me is, uh, is a good reminder of, of this. And as you mentioned, uh, part of uh, use of success in, 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 in the book and uh, in, in life is in the introduction, you know, of the way he grew up, responsible at a very early stage. So thank you very much. I would like to stop here to thank everyone. I'm in, in Paris for this meeting on the Chad and uh, France is organizing it on um, African development and so on. So on parallel, I'm meeting some people on the Chad and thank you very much. Uh, I hope to be able to follow the question and so to much. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, uh, learn from your experience. And what comes out most strongly to me is the challenges that are presented when working in, in these contexts and, and, and the need for, for uh, uh, collaboration and work with, with multiple partners that are proliferating today. There's so many uh, so many actors involved uh, today, as you, as you point out, and we're happy to see that you are still, still being uh, sought out um, to, uh, to, to help. Um, so our next, our next uh, speaker, is Professor Fumi Olunisaken, who is Vice President and Vice Principal International and Professor of Security, Leadership and Development at King's College London. Uh, she is a founding member of the African Leadership Center. In 2015, she was appointed by the Secretary General as one of the seven members of the advisory group of experts on the review of the United Nations peace building architecture. Uh, and she was also appointed in 2016 as a member of the advisory group of experts for the United Nations progress study on youth peace and security. I must confess, I think of uh, Professor Oli Sakin, of course, as, uh, as the author of the 2008 IPI book, uh, peacekeeping in Sierra Leone, the story of UNAMSL. Uh, Fumi, it's wonderful to see you. It's been a long time. Uh, that was one of the first projects I, I worked on way back in the day when I started at IPI. So it was great to have you. Um, as a scholar uh, and a member of the advisory group of experts, uh, you have taught leadership as it relates to issues of peace and security. Of course, uh, uh, much of this work is really central to, to this, uh, this book. What sort of um, key pointers would you take from this book for your students and other scholars that are involved in, in, your, in your study? Please, uh, the floor is yours, for me. Adam, thank you so very much. It's good to see you. And in a sense, it's a, a sort of reunion um, with you. Uh, I see, uh, I'm so looking forward to seeing, um, uh, to listening to uh, Oscar and um, Ambassador Oud Abdallah, who we last saw each other. I last saw him uh, during our work on the panel. Um, and a pleasure to be uh, on the same panel with my compatriot, um, Ambassador Mohammed. It's good to see you uh, so much, Adam. I think you and I now have more gray hairs than, <laughs> than we had when we last worked together. And I have to start by saying that that book, uh, The Story of Yunamsen, um, made a huge impact on me. Uh, in several respects. It was one of the first times that I had the freedom as a scholar to just really express myself um, 
in popular ways, but actually also delivering, doing good research and expressing it in a way that connects to the world uh, of policy and practice. And I must say that in a sense, it influenced me when I continue to look for how to bridge the gap between a generation of scholars and researchers who need so much to learn about you know, uh, the world of policy and practice. And, and, and in that sense, um, our work with the leading practitioners, uh, you know, has been so rewarding. I, I think actually it's one of the more exciting parts uh, of my work. And, and in that sense, two important sets of things have framed this book for me in a way that my students in the classroom, my both um, at master's and PhD level, will continue to engage with this kind of work. And that's uh, what is important to emphasize. Uh, shall I say two sorts of intersections? And one intersection, it's been mentioned already by several people, including um, uh, both Ambassador um, Youssef and, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and Albert, the conceptual bridge uh, between theory and practice, or if you like, between the world, the worlds of academy uh, and, uh, and policy, and the worlds of policy and practice. And in that sense, you see the dance between theory and practice and policy and practice. That continuum is something that is often missing from the ways in which we try to prepare our scholars and students for the real world uh, with which they will engage. And something is invariably missing because they either frame so theoretically that by the time they get to the field, they're seeing a different kind of world. That was my, that was my life as a PhD scholar uh, in world studies. And that was that's something I tried to bridge. The second intersection is that between generations. Uh, you could easily talk about generations of scholars, a professor, you know, uh, transferring knowledge back and forth and co-creating with a student. But in this case, a generation of a scholar practitioner himself and a scholar who had no UN experience and actually can see the world through the eyes of this scholar and also do some research and documentation that they both learn from. And intersecting with all of that is the question of methodology. Uh, most people pick up memoirs and they would raise questions. Publishers had raised this in the past when we try, when we, um, or at least the reviewers, when we started this series. And I'm glad to say that many of them have eaten their words because they'll say these practitioners just want to write. And how do we know that they, this is robust, this is rigorous? Uh, they might just be writing about themselves. And of course, you can just dismiss people and say, oh, they, you know, this is quite narcissistic. They're writing about themselves. This book really does a lot of rigorous uh, analysis. Why? Because Albert was able to interview many of the people that um, Professor Mahmoud interacted with anonymously. And you actually see in the book uh, in several parts, both on the Chad front and the Burundi front, where people spoke both positively and not so positively about that experience for a whole range of reasons. I think let, let's leave that there. I don't have a lot of time, but the thing I want to do is, you know, uh, the. The, the proof of this is in the pudding itself. I, I, and I want to draw people's attention uh, it, it, to, to pages that will tell you about the seamless connection between that theory and practice, policy and practice. Uh, page 34, for example, uh, leading to 35, just to read three or four lines from here. Um, uh, Ambassador Yusuf says, leadership for peace is not about the change that outsiders can bring about in ending violence and building peace. It's about listening meaningfully without preconceptions to we the peoples, those that UN missions are intended to serve in order to understand what local actors know and what capabilities they have that can be built upon. It also means suspending certainty and convictions about what should be considered right or correct for a period of time, thus allowing other ways of knowing to be experienced. But by his own very words, the kind of learning he's done here, uh, he, he concludes in that the unfortunate observation to be made here is that the current peace building paradigm continues to favor leadership approaches that contradict many of the nuances expanded above. Despite valiant efforts, I too succumbed on multiple occasions to the short term satisfaction and enlightened adherence of this paradigm offered. And he returns to this issue of leadership for peace later. It's that seamless interaction between, you know, his new conceptualizations of what leadership is or are actually new ways of seeing peace. 
that I found really fascinating here. He talks very, uh, you know, frankly and reflexively about this PNG experience uh, in Burundi, which I, I've observed myself in, in my time of observing uh, various uh, practitioners like, like him, that when people speak truth to power and try to do exactly what is needed in the field, um, then they're PNG'd, but you don't see the kind of backing that the UN gives them. And, and this, this uh, struck a chord with me. He, his ability to learn on the ground and learn uh, uh, by doing is incredible. And I want to conclude, and if everyone can see this, uh, his concluding thought on page 175, Jean Monnet liked to quote this saying from Dwight Moreau, the world is divided into people who do things and people who get credit. Try if you can to belong to the first class. There is far less competition. I like to think on the basis of what I shared in this book, that I belong to the first breed, notwithstanding some of the errors that I fell prey to along the way. The kind of reflexivity and the humility with which this story is woven together, and the fact that a researcher could work with a practitioner uh, to do the kind of uh, robust analysis that still makes that story so presentable to you is what I want to congratulate. I really love it about the book. I couldn't, I could imagine it when we started. Um, I couldn't believe it that we actually struck gold and got exactly what we wanted out of it. So I can't uh, wait uh, to, you know, to go through this book in my class uh, in September. And I thank Albert for already using it at the University of Buya. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a ringing endorsement, Yusuf. You should be very happy about that presentation. Um, but I, what I think is, is striking about it is and it's a theme that's been coming through this whole uh, discussion is that the book itself is a performance of the forms of leadership and conceptualization that is written about in the book. And actually, it's, it's, a, uh, it's the performance itself of that model for of leadership for peace, which is quite fascinating and well recommended. Um, wonderful. We've got a, we, we've got one more speaker, and then we will we will hopefully have time for a little bit of a Q and A. So those of you who are watching, if you want to type in a question or two, I think we'll gather a few questions, and then go back to the get to the panelists for final remarks before we finish. Um, but now uh, we have uh, Mr. Oscar Fernandez Taranco, who has been Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support since 2014. Prior uh, to this, he was Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs, where he was responsible for overseeing the department's divisions dealing with the Americas, Asia and Pacific, Europe, Middle East and West Asia, and the decolonization unit and division for Palestinian rights. Uh, a wealth of experience here for us to apply some of these lessons. Um, perhaps as, uh, as uh, ASU for Peace Building, you could uh, share with us how you see this work in relationship to uh, the UN Sustaining Peace Agenda and other aspects of your work, please. Fair the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. And, and it is also a big, big, big pleasure and a big honor to be part of this um, book launch, um, which really is, 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 a, is an incredible reflection on so many of the challenges that we have even in the UN to actually listen and adapt many of the lessons learned that uh, Dr. Youssef Mahmoud and Dr. Albert uh, Biatem have, uh, have presented. So it's a, a really a very personal journey in peace leadership that this uh, book presents us with. And uh, just also let me thank IPI uh, for facilitating this launch and uh, a very strong appreciation uh, as well to my fellow discussant, all friends actually, uh, Ambassador Mohammed, Ambassador Ul Abdallah, Fumi, with whom we worked so closely on the review of the peace building architecture. Uh, this is a big honor to be with you all. And collectively, um, you have all, you know, shared uh, your experience and insights that have really contributed to how the UN's effort in building and sustaining peace have been evolving. Um, Yusuf, in particular, your leadership and experiences and then the lessons that you draw in it, in your book, really resonate not just with me, but uh, many colleagues in the UN, uh, particularly in the context of peace building and sustaining peace. And so I, I would like to, in the interest of time, just come up with uh, three or four quick points um, in terms of how this can relate to the, to the UN's work in this field. First, um, it is, as Yusuf points out very well, it's very tempting when building peace to just zoom in mainly on conflict and to pay only the scant attention to the countries that have made peace work. 
as you conclude very wisely, in every society, however broken it may appear, it has capacities and assets, not just needs and vulnerabilities that need to be fixed. We indeed need to look at what capacities and assets are affected. And that is also the core of the Pathways for Peace, uh, the, it's the defining uh, joint UN World Bank report, which actually also tries to focus on what keeps countries on the pathway for peace, not just what makes you stray away from it. And in this sense, you know, looking at positive peace, going beyond negative peace or the avoidance of violence becomes quite central in this paradigmic shift that Yusuf is proposing. The second is that we are very pleased to see the reframing of prevention, not only as a conflict transformation tool, but also as a governance and development strategy for building and sustaining peace. Development and prevention are essentially two sides of the same coin. Development policies and programs are at the core of preventive efforts and vice versa. It is a lesson that the UN, to be honest, can still take to heart. We should be better at leveraging this 2030 agenda in this regard. The agenda actually offers avenues to engage national governments and other stakeholders to foster inclusion and resilience, reduce inequalities and address conflict drivers as part of the sustainable development goals. The third point would be, and here I really enjoyed reading this personal observation on transformational, inclusive, people-centered and adaptable leadership for peace. In a way, what you describe are also the ingredients of successful peace building itself, not just the individuals driving it. You acknowledge that building peace is, and I quote here, a participatory inclusive exercise drawing on the priorities and objectives of the populations, end of quote. And this for me is the essential part of the, the whole of society ambition of the 2016 twin resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly on peace building and sustaining peace, which was again reconfirmed last year. This is why we launched in PBSO last year and the UN system-wide community engagement guidelines on peace building and sustaining peace, which highlights the recommendation of the UN's meaningful and inclusive engagement with civil society actors around the ground and actually defines very much the approach, the, the methodological approach when we are designing uh, and supporting interventions through the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund. And I am grateful uh, to the numerous reference that uh, Yusuf has in the book in terms of how this instrument actually helped him rethink uh, much of the positioning of the UN in many of the places he served. Um, I always like to say that inclusivity is a win-win, that it accelerates progress on all the sustainable development goals, and it builds trust in government institutions and strengthens social cohesion, which are all incredibly important to harness this peace. It requires constant work through, as in a way, it is always an unfinished business. Not surprisingly, inclusion and, and this special focus on women and youth is also central to the Secretary General's ambition in this common agenda as initiated in the context of the UN's uh, 75th anniversary. The agenda to renew efforts to strengthen solidarity among peoples and between societies links strongly with a powerful South African perspective of Ubuntu. I am because you are and together we are one that you suggest us to take inspiration from in, lead, in, 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 in peace leadership. And finally, the, the last point, I, I appreciate the metaphor in the book that looks at peace like a tree growing from bottom up, where you emphasize that it is individuals and communities that are the true custodians of peace. To take that metaphor further, that means that we need to carefully analyze the local soil where the tree should root and where it has successfully done so. This requires peace building that is simply more local, more regional, and of course, without losing sight of the universality of our values. Already the COVID-19 pandemic out of necessity has created more local, national, and regional ownership in prevention, with many being preoccupied with their own recovery. The extent of local peace building initiatives is quite noteworthy. It also requires what you highlight eloquently as the power 
of intently listening and understanding, investigating with, with great care what lies beneath the visible drivers of conflict. And as you say here, context is king. It is a lesson we are heeding at the UN, but I hope many will read your personal account to see it not just as a theory, but as a lesson in effective peace leadership. Joint analysis and integrated planning are structural pillars on which to drive prevention forward. We need these shared and conflict sensitive baselines that analyzes the multidimensionality of risks. And in the UN, the new common country analysis is key to that end. It should truly be conflict sensitive and steer prevention programming within these new UN cooperation frameworks. And so once again, just my compliments to you, Yusuf and Albert, for this very valuable and personal reflections that you have given us. Um, I can only encourage many of you to read the book to internalize its important lessons. I personally believe it should be required uh, reading for any new SRSG, DSRSG, or resident coordinator that is deployed to the field because there's a lot of truth, a lot of lessons that will allow the, the, the leaders, at least in the UN, to make effective use of that position to create that inclusive and conducive environment to help peace building from a bottom-up perspective. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that is that is uh, you hit right on uh, to me. What is the core point? Is this is this bottom up up uh, a perspective which is so critical to to leadership for peace, as Yusuf uh, and Albert articulated. So we have just just uh, really 10, 15 minutes left, but we do have some questions, and so I'd like to just uh, read a few of these questions and then come back to to the panel for just a minute or two of uh, of responses, final uh, final remarks, and then we'll turn back to to Yusuf. If and, uh, and maybe Albert, if he, if he would like to, uh, to give us um, a closing uh, in responses to any of the questions. So there, there as typical, there, there's some difficult questions here on, on, on the table, but let me, let me uh, uh, tell you. Um, first of all, I mean, we, the book is, um, is framed in terms of Africa. And so we do have a question is that, is that um, what, is there something particular about Africa? What kind of leadership does Africa need for uh, to sustain to sustain peace? Um, and how can that leadership uh, be nurtured? I think maybe uh, uh, Professor Alona Sakin has uh, um, been working on this quite a bit. Um, the, the second question uh, goes to actually the uh, the exact quote um, that Oscar you point to that is um, that that peace is like a tree growing from the bottom up. Uh, and, and the question is taking this metaphor further, um, to what extent is that tree currently being watered or fertilized um, by the United Nations uh, today? And how, how, is that, how is that working? Another big question. And, uh, and finally, one, uh, one of the most difficult question in some ways is how, does this, how do these lessons that we've learned from uh, the context in Burundi and, and uh, in Irkut and, and such, uh, translate to, to other areas and current uh, grave conflicts. And there's a question about is what can we learn from uh, this leadership for peace for the current uh, conflicts in the Middle East? Is there something that we can apply uh, to the current situation uh, today? Um, difficult questions to answer uh, in, a, in a minute or two, <laughs> uh, but uh, but I think what they reflect is really the the, the importance of these of these reflections um, and the content of the book. So why don't we perhaps, um, um, Ambassador uh, Wafumi, you're on you're on camera now. Why don't we go go straight to, to you, and then uh, uh, and then we'll we'll uh, give the floor to Ambassador uh, Mohammed and and. Uh, Dalla as well before we turn to and, and Oscar before we return to the uh, speakers. Right. No, thank you. I mean, let me not uh, spend so much time on this because when we think about the kind of leadership that Africa needs, uh, I think it's important to think about it in terms of the interaction uh, between institutions and leadership. Leadership, not about the single individual. There's never an individual who makes a difference, no matter how good or well intentioned they are. It's always about the interaction be between that individual and the context and the situation they're in and the people affected uh, collectively by that situation. And so we can see societies where if you have long lasting institutions that they've all bought into, that they believe in, 
even when you do not have uh, you know a fair a fairly robust leadership infrastructure um, they might still get along get on with with the job the challenge with africa is this that if you are speaking of uh, states uh, that do not have institutions you know that are particularly strong that are also handed down institutions that are not based on their own norms and values it has taken time decades after uh, the end of colonial rule to do that and with all of the disruptions you really do need really uh, you know that that relationship building that the authors talk about the relational aspect of leadership is really of necessity uh, to drive anything forward uh, and I, I think it's not that there's exceptionalism in Africa, but that in, in Africa, you really can talk about leadership being the gateway to institution building and not the other way around, uh, especially if there are no institutions, you know, that you can uh, speak of in that sense. That that's both a theoretical, uh, what do you call it, a framing, but also something that we have noticed in practice. And that's what makes this book are really so useful in trying to see leadership as something that is not about someone at the top of a vertical hierarchy. But let me leave it like that, uh, you know, and hope that there'll be other times that we can talk some more about this. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Mohammed. Um, thank you, thank you, Adam. No, I couldn't agree uh, more with uh, with um, uh, Professor Lani Sakin. Um, I think um, as a whole, leadership requires a vision and a strategy um, and consistency of, of the whole. And uh, there are certain preconditions, obviously, such as good governance, social inclusion, respect for human rights, et cetera. But none of these uh, can be achieved without you know, strong institutions, building strong institutions um, and true leadership and, uh, you know, the political will uh, to bring about and, 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 and sustain peace. Um, but we also have to bridge um, uh, many of the gaps. So we've talked about, you know, uh, gender gaps, uh, generational gaps, uh, access and inclusion. Um, so leadership should not be seen uh, necessarily as um, uh, bottom up or top bottom uh, in terms of uh, how it's uh, how it's um, um, it, it, the issues are implemented, but it needs to be balanced in a way that at every level, whether it's grassroots, community level, all the way to the policy level, that there is a balance and that balance allows um, leaders to kind of respond to the needs uh, of the communities that they are leading. Um, so I think strong institutions definitely, but we definitely need to also focus on um, uh, bridging some of these gaps. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Oldabdala. Do you have any uh, any final words to comments on the questions? Oh, sorry, sir. Again, you're on mute. Hello. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I think on leadership, the continent is large and a huge place. We cannot have the same kind of leadership in every African country. Uh, our tendency in Africa is to compare. And if I would like to do the same, I will appreciate to quote the Chinese leader who said, whatever a cat is black or white, provided he can catch mice. So we need a leadership who can deliver, like in Singapore, like in Malaysia. But my impression, you know, because we have uh, a tendency to go together, we, we ignore sometimes the importance of some issues in one region uh, compared to others. Second, leadership at all level now should include more and more the debate on social network. Whatever they are irrational or extremist, they are, as a matter of fact, part of the debate in Africa now and they are uncontrolled. They have all the inconvenient and advantage, but they are there. Communication on leadership, including on security. I work on the Sahel. 
the debate is not in the capital or in Europe, it is on social networks. We, we have to, to include that in our, uh, uh, our thinking. And uh, transparency, today with social network, we cannot ignore transparency. You know, so it is a necessity uh, for our leaders at all level to be more transparent and without being demagogue to include more women at all level in economy, in, in, in business. And I'm saying that my aunt who raised me was chief of tribe for 10 years. So uh, I'm not saying something um, to follow a path. It is by conviction that, that is this is what uh, I would like to, thank, to say, but to thank you all, and especially Yusuf on what you wrote about Chad and on Burundi, I agree with him, but really on the Chad, it is amazing that how actually it is now. Thank you. Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you. Taking thank you. my train back to Brussels. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fernando Saranko, any final final words, thoughts, uh, yeah. difficult questions on the table? Yeah, no, thank you, Adam. I mean, it's it's interesting as we're launching the book, the Peace Building Commission is having a, a whole discussion about the importance of institution building, which Ambassador Mohammed and others were, were referring to. And I think it's this notion about how you're building institutions that are that are open, transparent, democratic, inclusive, that are part of the solution to actually, that are part of the infrastructure, the national infrastructures of peace need to be built at that national level. But I think the important uh, points that Yusuf and, and Albert bring out in this book is also to never forget that peace is built by the people. The, the peace is now built by institutions in the abstract. It, it requires people to be in the leadership position, to own the process. We need to invest, and this is counterintuitive. I mean, for the many reasons that Yusuf outlines in the book because of how council mandates are are, 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 are structured, the realities on the ground, uh, the counterparts that we have to deal with. But this notion that the leadership responsibility is to ensure that we are creating inclusive uh, frameworks where people can actually be heard, listened to so that their priorities, their resilience, their capacities are being strengthened and that the instruments that we bring to bear as external partners here, are supporting a people-centered approach to peace building because this is the only way that we build peace and that it is sustainable is that we put people at the center of this equation. So just a final point, a lot of the few instruments that we have at our disposal, like for example, the peace building fund is engineered to precisely address those type of very decentralized manners of supporting uh, both institution capacity building programs, the state structures, if you will, but also the community structures to be able to empower women, to empower youth, to give them the means so that they can actually build the mechanisms to prevent violent conflict from escalating, but also to focus on those very long-term but crucial issues of reconciliations, of trust building, of, uh, how can I say, managing these type of conflicts in a peaceful manner, and this requires the type of investment that few are actually undertaking. And so here, uh, just to say that this, the, 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 the analogy of the tree is quite central to the way that we approach uh, through our instruments, the support to people-centered uh, solutions for peace building. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't have much time, but of course we need to turn back to our, to our authors um either to respond to some of the questions some of the interventions give us some concluding remarks um yusuf uh, i don't know if albert would like to is going to want to chime in who wants to go first yusuf um I'll, I'll make two quick comments i'm conscious of the time as you okay. said one is to answer your question what i learned from albert um what I learned from Albert is research methodology and rigor. This is not just my own recollections in a political memoir. It's something that has to, had to follow specific research protocols that I was not familiar with. Um, so that's one of the things that I have learned um, from Albert in addition to various other anchorings, which we don't have the time to delve into. 
The second, I want to pick up uh, on some of the comments that I have um, made by uh, Ambassador Chiari, and, and this is about the unbelievable leadership of the African Union in the Burundi context. That one really deserves a book by itself. Um, the other point and the final one is this metaphor that peace is like a tree built from the bottom up. The reason we came up with this metaphor is because sometimes we focus so much on watering the water, the, the, uh, on watering the leaves and we starve the roots. In fact, the roots die. Uh, similarly, um, when you uh, deal with the roots, you deal from inside out, not only bottom up. Uh, and, and we try to elaborate what that means. And in, in order for it to be sustainable, you need institutions. Um, uh, finally, I must uh, really congratulate um, PBSO and, and Oscar and their team for um, devoting so much resources and attention to the grassroots work and to the civil society in the way they manage the, the, the peace building thrust fund. And that is something that was not available in the early days when I... And the final one is Albert and I, we need to work on uh, technology and sustaining peace, uh, my brother. So thank you all. It's been uh, wonderful uh, to really have had this generous uh, yes. support uh, and these very helpful uh, reflections. I greatly appreciate them. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Yusuf. Albert, Albert did you have any uh, final final words? Yeah, uh, just, uh, just a very brief on that is uh, I, I saw a question is uh, related to the agrophone crisis in Cameroon and it's connected to <clears throat> leadership and peace. And she said uh, that, uh, she, of course, is answered in the book. And it's just about what we have been saying, the, the discussion or the panelists, like uh, Mahmoud Joseph says, from, it, so, it seemed like a tree going from bottom up. Uh, if the voices of the grassroots are undermined, and there is a problem. And in the specific case of Cameroon, the voices of the grassroots have largely been undermined. So if you think about it, uh, bringing up or considering the voices of the grassroots in order to achieve a sustainable peace uh, is a condition sine qua non uh, to the process. Uh, so uh, this is my brief uh catch up to the question and we can see uh discuss uh over eight days on zero thank you very much wonderful thank you thank you so much yes i mean I, this has really been a very rich discussion and one that could clearly go on much further but i think you hut on really the core of, of, of this discussion um in in terms of um a quote that i'm looking at right now from the from the book society's capacity to self-organize uh, while it can be supported by external actors, um, it must ultimately emerge from within and from the bottom up. We've been discussing the tree, um, but it also one thing that 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 the book is careful to describe is that that can't be done uncritically either. Um, we have to understand. Uh, we have to be able to understand the local context um, and in a in a more profound way. Um, and so. It is about scholarship as, as, as well as leadership. And uh, I think this group has brought that all, all together in a, in a fundamentally important way. And I've, I've really learned from this discussion um, and I recommend the book highly. Thank you all so very much. Um, uh, Yusuf, again, it's been, uh, it's been an honor to work with you and to learn from you over these years. And I look forward to seeing you in person soon. I hope to see uh, all of you in person uh, soon someday when we're all back together. Uh, and uh, to our audience online, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, please uh, have um, um, look look for this. Continue to look for this space. We will continue to follow up on these issues that are of such importance uh, to to all of us. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>